Okay. There we go. Today's topic, relieve, restore, or replace. Treatment choices in osteoarthritis and joint pain. Joint replacements are not just for the elderly. Many athletes also require joint replacements. Today, we will find out all about joint pain and possible treatment. Before I introduce our speaker, thank you, a warm thank you to my good friend, Ali Raza Rajani for making the introduction. Thank you, Ali. Our speaker, Dr. Sayed Yasser Haider, is a senior orthopedic consultant surgeon at Markham Stobel Hospital in the greater Toronto area. He trained at the world famous Royal London and St. Bart's Hospital, that's in London, England. His training in joint preservation surgery techniques was in Oxford, England. Dr. Haider is an expert in the field of cartilage repair using cutting edge techniques for sports injuries and osteoarthritis, especially in younger and more active individuals. He has a special interest in orthopedic pain management and the field of regenerative orthopedics and joint preservation. You can tell I'm not well versed in medical terms, so I'm struggling with this osteo, osteo, whatever. <laughs> Dr. Haider is a leading expert, teacher, and trainer in using techniques like orthobiologics for the treatment of osteoarthritis and how to avoid early joint replacement surgery. Dr. Haider is a fellow of the Intercollegiate Board of the Royal College of Surgeons in the UK. And he also has an orthopedic fellowship from the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Canada. We are so fortunate to have someone with such credentials, experience, and expertise to speak to us this afternoon. Dr. Haider, we look forward to your presentation. You need to unmute yourself. Thank you, everyone, for joining okay. us uh, this weekend. Uh, my name, as uh, uh, Mr. Damji said, um, you know, it's it, it is a weekend, and you are spending your time for. Uh, a topic which has touched everybody's life or at least anybody's fam uh, family member's life. Um, my name is uh, Dr. Said Haider. I'm an orthopedic surgeon at Markham Sewell Hospital. Uh, my specialty or special interest is joint preservation, um, arthritis, its treatment, especially in early um, osteoarthritic knee joints and hip joints. Um, and today we're gonna to talk about our treatment choices, what's available, what's the future, and how do we make decisions based on these choices. That's why I had named this um, top, uh, this presentation, Relieve, Restore, and Replace. Um, arthritis is affecting millions of people all over the world. And just in Canada, we do over 160,000 joint replacements a year, uh, which is a significant proportion and it is getting more and more every year. So next slide, please. So I just wanna introduce my hospital, my team, and especially my OR team. We work um, in unison and our team is uh, what we depend on. So I really feel obliged that I should be introducing my team members. We are seven orthopedic surgeons. We have different specialty interests, but our OR team, which is made of anesthesiologists, nurses, 
and our assistant physicians who work with us every day tirelessly. So I just want to acknowledge them. On the top left-hand corner is the Markham Stowell Hospital, which is just north of uh, Toronto. Uh, if you guys are not aware, um, we are about half an hour from downtown. Next, please. So osteoarthritis to general public and to most of you, uh, what that means is joint pain, stiffness, swelling, unable to walk, unable to carry out your day-to-day -day activities, interference with, interference with work and leisure activities. Next, please. And worldwide, like I said, uh, we have uh, been afflicted by COVID and everybody talks about COVID. But on the other hand, which we have not been able to put too much attention towards is this another global pandemic. Uh, actually, there are three pandemics and they are converging into one big storm uh, of obesity, aging population and osteoarthritis. And the graphs of all three of them are going up exponentially. Next, please. So as we can see here, uh, in, it is getting uh, worse in females, more so than in males. But if you look at the biggest jump is in between the age group of 45 to 65, um, uh, where it starts going up exponentially. Um, and it is uh, like um, we said earlier, it's not a disease of older people anymore. If you look it's the age group of 45 to 64, where the biggest increase is. Next, please. And these are just basic statistics. Uh, one in five adults uh, report arth arthritis. Um, um, it, it is one of the top causes of disability. It affects more women than men, and it affects uh, three out of five people of working age. Um, and every 60 seconds, a new diagnosis is made on osteoarthritis. Next, please. So I just wanted to clarify this confusion because osteoarthritis, word osteo confuses, confuses everybody. People think osteo is to do with the bones. Osteoarthritis is a misnomer. It is actually a disease of cartilage, not the bones. It gets confused with osteoporosis very often. And it is a disease of not the bones, but the cartilage. Osteoporosis is a disease of bone. Osteoarthritis is a disease of cartilage. Cartilage is that white stuff people chew at the end of a chicken drumstick, as you can see there, that white thing at the end of the bone, that's the cartilage. On the left-hand side, there's a microscopic view of the cartilage. And on the extreme right-hand side, you will see a knee x-ray where you see bone touching the bone, and that's where the problem is. And I'll explain this further down the road. Next, please. So what are the factors which lead to osteoarthritis? Um, there are a few factors we can control, few factors we cannot. The, one of the biggest factors I've found over the years is the genetics and uh, science and research bears on this and confirms this, that genetics are really important. If you have some family members up, uh, up your family tree, you most likely will have some, some level of arthritis. Number two is obesity, uh, which is common sense. If you put more load on your joints, uh, then they're gonna wear out faster. But the new research also tells us that uh, the fat content of your body secretes a hormone which can also destroy the cartilage. Hence, people also who are obese can also get arthritis in the shoulder joints, which are non-weight bearing joints and body weight does not affect the shoulder joints, but they still get arthritis more in the shoulders than the normal population. Aging, so obesity we can control and I won't go into the details, but uh, the, le le the more active we are, the better it is. Aging, we cannot control. World population is aging fast. I never used to see 95, 96 year old people walking into my office and managing their own farms up north of Toronto, but now we do. So aging is also a factor which uh, cartilage gets thinner and thinner and thinner. And last one is injuries, whether sports injuries, falls. Uh, joints do not forget injuries. They remember them and come back to haunt you 50, 60 years down the road. Next, please. So here's the combination of age and weight. This is what age does, uh, or uh, plus the weight. The, 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 this, this truck, what's gonna happen to the tires, we're gonna see in one second. Next, please. So this is what happens. So if you have 
an old tire with lots of load on it, 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 it fails. Next, please. So in, in human term, this is what happens to us. If we are overweight and if we are getting older, the cartilage, which this one of my arthroscopic surgery views will tell you the joints will, will this will what happen. You can see a little hook or little finger sticking in the joint in the middle. And then there's my metal hook, which is actually pulling that broken cartilage. And this tells you that in a human body, the tire fails in this, this fashion. So this is the first uh, step. And then everything goes downhill after. Next, please. So if you look at this, the, on, the, on the left side is a brand new tire. And on the right hand side, this is a tire which is worn out. This is exactly what happens to our joints. The cartilage, which is like a rubber, wears out over the years when there's a lot of mileage and a lot of weight. Next, please. So I will, I will uh, uh, give the analogy of a pothole on a road. So the first sign of arthritis is like a pothole on the road. The road itself is fine, but it starts with a small blemish or a small gap in the cartilage. So this is the early form. This is when it starts, when you are in your 40s, 50s, or trauma or injury. And you can see on the right-hand side, this is a picture of a joint where you see a yellow surface, which exactly looks like a pothole. And what we do surgically, we go in, we make multiple holes and try to grow the cartilage on top of this, this pothole, like filling a pothole with tarmac. And if you can see on the left-hand side, it gets covered. So this is if you catch it early. Next, please. So just to let you know that one pound of body weight increase is equal to four pounds on your knees. So if we gain one pound, our knees will have the feeling of four pounds. And so the weight will be multiplied by four times. Next, please. And age. Age is just a number. Age, you have to keep it in perspective that 60 years old is not an old person anymore. And people are getting active, more active, living longer and healthier, and they're pushing the limits all the time. Next, please. We have another crisis brewing. I call this midlife knee crisis. And I put this picture up because I see these patients who have achieved a lot in their, rightly so, in their lifetime. And now they are able to fulfill their dreams. They're in their 50s. And especially men, I would say, we go more for these sports cars and low cars. And what that does is an old knee sitting in a sports car, which is too low, results in certain problems. So I call this a midlife knee crisis. I see this all the time. It's interesting. I've noticed this over the years. Um, and the, that thing happens, which I showed you earlier, the meniscus breaks. Next slide, please. So look, look at these people who have been successful in their life. They, met, they went ahead and bought these low cars. They are tall people but look how they get out in and out of the car. So poor knee, which is already losing cartilage, and if you twist badly on it, that's what happened. They, they say, doc, I heard a snap and everything went downhill. My knee swelled up. So this is the beginning of a problem. Next, please. So how do we diagnose osteoarthritis? Um, we do not need anything fancy to diagnose an osteoarthritis. Pain, stiffness, which affects the quality of your life, supported by x-rays, which are proper x-rays, not lying down, but standing x-rays. I've had these problems for years and I've tried to convince my other colleagues to ask for standing x-rays, which will tell you about arthritis, but lying x-rays, lying down x-rays have no value. Ultrasounds have no value. MRI scans have value in very few cases. And I'll, I'll explain this further down. Next, please. So here on the left-hand side, you see an X-ray of the same person lying down. And that person, when it stands and get an X-ray, you can see how the bone on the right-hand side touches the other bone. So if you have an X-ray, just see the X-ray of the left side, you will say, hmm, mild arthritis, just take some pills. But if you look at the X-ray, the same person standing, you can see the difference how the bone has touch the bone on the, on the right-hand side, and that is severe arthritis, not mild arthritis. 
So just be careful what kind of x-rays you get. Next, please. Okay, so what is the goal of um, our discussion today and goal of the patient and the surgeon? I think it's important that we all are in, on the same page. When we are talking about arthritis, we understand arthritis, that it's a cartilage disease, not a bony disease. We have discussed the causes, what causes arthritis, and how do we diagnose it? And now we come to, to treatment. The next slide, please. So what is the goal of treatment? And that is my motto during my discussions with my patients and the treatments, that we are treating your pain, not your x-ray. So x-ray just helps me to diagnose the problem, but that does not make a decision for me. What makes the decision of treatment for me is my patient, their symptoms, and what they're looking for. Next, please. So we can manage pain in many different ways. People come to us with arthritis because it hurts. They don't know their x-rays. They don't know what the MRI scan shows, but they know that their life has changed. It, it, it affects them, it hurts them, they cannot sleep, et cetera, et cetera. So these are the few things which you can introduce in your life um, with lifestyle changes, weight loss, uh, doing the activities which are not hurting the knees, uh, especially the lunging and squatting um, and other things which are really helpful in dealing with stiffness and pain is physiotherapy, anti-inflammatories, braces and injections. Now I'll touch on them a little bit, the last four. Physiotherapy is important for the joint movement because movement increases the health of the cartilage and increases the blood flow and increases the healing of the cartilage if there's a cartilage damage going on. I'm not a big fan of the pills and I've seen many patients who are on long-term NSAIDs or non-steroid anti-inflammatories who get kidney cells affected by these medications to so be extremely careful taking these pills long-term. Braces, they work in, in, in specific certain group of people, but size of the leg and fitting of the brace is really crucial. And braces are basically to support your knee. They do not improve the health of your uh, quality of your cartilage or range of motion. So I like them in the very certain specific areas, but not for everybody. And injections, I'll discuss a little bit more, which is very common and a very effective treatment for osteoarthritis. Not every arthritic joint needs surgery. Next, please. So here's an example of how the brace works. So you look at the guy on the left-hand side, he's driving a tractor and he doesn't have a wheel at the front, but he's got his wife to help him sit on one side of the tractor and tractor is still going. This is what braces do. If you look at the, uh, the image on the right-hand side, this type of brace can offload that part of the joint, which is bone touching the bone. And by pushing the knee from outside, still leaving you to be able to bend your knee, can improve that gap on the inside so that bone does not touch the bone. So if you look at that tractor, if that, that, that spoke uh, touches, the, uh, touches the road, it's gonna be a problem. So just offload that compartment. That's how the braces work. Next, please. Injections, there are three main types of injections and they should be done properly under proper and if they are difficult, challenging spots in your body, ultrasound should be used as a guidance. But there are three, three types of injections we use for the treatment of arthritis. One is cortisone, other one is a gel, and the last ones, which are the more popular ones now, and uh, where lots of research is happening is the orthobiologics where we're using the cells from your own body, trying to reduce your inflammation and heal some of the damage to the cartilage. Um, the, the, the cortisone is like giving an anti-inflammatory pill in your joint, uh, which is like Advil in the knee joint, excuse me. <clears throat> and that lasts for a few months. It has some side effects, but it works really well for a short period of time. The gels, they are expensive. They're not covered but they last longer and they're usually covered by third-party insurances, but they, they are like putting oil in an old rusted machine. It lasts for a bit, then you have to put more. 
the the autobiologics, the commonest one used is PRP, which is the cells from your own blood, which are concentrated in high concentration by centrifuging uh, the, the platelets and centrifuging the platelets and then injecting them into the affected joint. This tends to reduce inflammation, heal the cartilage, the top layer of the cartilage. We used to think it grows the cartilage. It does not grow the cartilage. It replenishes only the top layer of the cartilage if you have the base layer. So it only works in first two grades of arthritis, but not when you're bone on bone. Next, please. So here's uh, the, uh, the red blood cells and then the white things are platelets. This is what we uh, concentrate in the centrifuge and inject. Next, please. And autobiologics are getting advanced. Now we're using the neon juvenile cartilage cells to fill in these potholes in the knee joints, which uh, we do in the early form of arthritis to prevent this going downhill to avoid knee replacements too soon. And the problem with knee replacement too soon, I'll discuss in a, sh in a short while. Uh, but this is another form of autobiologics where we're actually using cells to fill up the holes in the cartilage so that cartilage can heal. It only works in very confined lesions and if your rest of the joint looks pretty healthy. So PRP mixed with this, we can still save lots of joints. Next, please. So here's an example. I just want, I should have warned you. There are some pictures which are, which you'll see um, some blood. So I do apologize, but I just, just highlight the point. This is a kneecap of a patient. And if you see, there's a big defect in the, in the kneecap and I'm drilling and I make these multiple drill holes. And then if you can see on the right-hand side, I filled it with these new cells and this should go on to heal to a normal cartilage. Next, please. So science has advanced significantly. Now we are working on uh, 3D printing the cartilage. This is uh, done in Duke University in uh, North Carolina where they 3D printed an earlobe, which is a cartilage, as you know, uh, with the cartilage ink. And I think this is the future. We are having a hard time right now trying to bond this cartilage to the bone, but it shouldn't be in too far distant future. Next, please. So this is how uh, an arthritic knee uh, patient walks. You can see some people walking in the mall or outside with bow-legged, uh, with, 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 uh, with, who are bow-legged and other people who have knocked knee. This is also, uh, based on which part of the knee you have arthritis in. If your arthritis is on the inside of the knee, you will be bow-legged. If it's on the outside of the knee, you will be knocked knee. Next, please. Then comes the decision of what if everything else fails and we have to go ahead and do the knee replacement. Before we do that, before we discuss that, I would like to equate, let take an example of a knee. Uh, which is the commonest arthritis, by the way, and commonest surgery performed, uh, is I equate knee to a three-bedroom house. A three-bedroom house will have carpet in all three of them, and knees like that. Knee has three compartments, one on the inside, on the right-hand side, one on the left side, and one in the front, which is on the top. In medical terms, they're called medial, lateral, and telephonic compartments. Uh, it, it really is crucial that surgeon knows where this arthritis is, because that will dictate what kind of treatment you or, or uh, your knee needs, uh, which is best for you. And that's based on your age, your health risks, and so on and so forth. If the carpet in your living room is gone and the carpet in your bedroom and the dining room is fine, or uh, carpet is gone in one bedroom and other two bedrooms are fine, why would you change the carpet in the whole house? You don't need to when you have a limited amount of funds. Same thing in the human body. If the cartilage is gone on one side of your knee, why would you let anybody replace your whole knee when you're only in your 50s and you need another 40 years? Next, please. So here it is. So this is a healthy cartilage, healthy carpet, or new carpet, and the worn out carpet. Cartilage looks exactly the same. This is a great analogy of how the carpet works. Carpet just covers the floor. Cartilage just covers the bone so that knee can move smoothly or you can walk comfortably. Next, please. So hence comes the discussion of a partial knee versus full knee replacement. The biggest reason I do partial knees and there are a few surgeons who can do, who do partial knees and I was lucky enough to train uh, in, 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 in the hospitals where this was being invented. Um, so I've done over, I think, 
2,000 of these. And I can tell you that um, partial knee has a lot more advantages than the full knee if done in the right person. Uh, partial knee, which is on the left-hand side, tells you that you are only resurfacing that compartment, which is bad, which is bone on bone, and you're not touching the healthy cartilage and bone, which you're going to need down the road. For example, if you're 50 years old, and God forbid, if you need a knee replacement, if you had a full knee replacement, which should last you about 15 years on average, you'll be 65 and you'll be needing your second knee replacement. And second knee replacement is a way bigger surgery, which only lasts about seven to eight years. So by the time you're 72, you are out of options. So you're in the wheelchair or you're sitting, crying, walk, not be able to walk and so on and so forth. But if, you, if you're a candidate for a partial knee, if you are a good candidate, then if you get a partial knee, that should itself give 15 years. But when you come back after 15 years, if you do, your next surgery is your first full knee replacement, not your second full knee replacement. So that means 15 years plus 15 years. And then you another option if you need be. Hopefully you will never need one after the first partial knee replacement. But if you do, then at the age of 72, uh, at the age of let's say 82, you, you still have one option left. So if you're 50 and if you do a partial and if, you, if that wears out in 15 years, then next is your first full knee replacement which will give you another 15 years and you still have seven years, one left if need be. So this is the biggest advantage of Oxford partial knee replacement. It also has an advantage that preserves your ligaments, in, all your ligaments inside your knee as, as opposed to the full knee replacement. So people who play tennis, golf, and were active, they like partial knee more so than the full knee replacement because it allows them to do more and function better. Next, please. So here's an example. Sorry about the images. And I, as, as I said, there will be some uh, gory images, but I, there's not much blood in here. So hopefully it should be okay. Uh, as you can see here, this is a knee. And if you look at the right-hand side, the kneecap has flipped over and you can see that the marks, like as, as if there are tire marks on the road on this, uh, where there's complete loss of cartilage and pink bone is showing. But if you look at the knee, the rest of the bone, it's well covered with the cartilage. So where I'm, my hand is, and if my forceps is that metal forceps, if you look right underneath it, that area is worn out. And the kneecap, which is flipped over towards us, that's worn out. So these two have been rubbing. So this person will have tremendous pain going down the stairs, kneeling, squatting, lunging. But otherwise, be, he or she will be able to walk fine. So why change the whole knee when she's only 55 years old? Next, please. So this is just to show you that in a full knee replacement, this is the amount of bone we lose. On the left-hand side, these are all the cuts we make to put the total knee implant uh, on, on the femur. Next, please. So there's a lot of bone loss. And when it wears out, this is how badly it wears out. So if you look at how this implant, especially this plastic piece, how it worn out after 15 years, and when you go in, remove all this, you'll remove lots of healthy bone. So there's not enough bone left to be able to do too many surgeries on this. And that's why I was saying that in people who are elderly, uh, sorry, people who are obese, they're not only at risk of developing osteoarthritis, but they also are at a risk of losing and destroying their artificial joints too soon. Next, please. So again, those, that math, just to remind you, if you get a partial, you have a potential of 37 years on top of what you are now. And if you have a full, you have 22 years on top of what you have now apart from the other advantages of faster recovery, less risks, and so on and so forth. Next, please. So this is a, a patient with bilateral partial knee. I do tons of them bilateral, both knees at the same day. They can go home same day or the next morning. Next, please. Here's another example of partial knee. When the kneecap is worn out, why change the whole knee? So just to show you the same patient which you saw earlier will have similar treatment rest of the cartilage and bone we are preserving for the rest for the for later years if need be. Next, please. Nowadays, there's a big push and pandemic has accelerated this. But when I went to US, my family lives in US and I traveled back and forth quite a lot. You see these billboards on the highways. And about three years ago, and I think this is three or four years ago, we saw this and um, basically hospital over there compete for the patients and they advertise themselves. 
So this is basically where the orthopedics is moving towards that early recovery, early discharges. And um, we, have, we are lucky enough to be one of the first hospitals in GTA to start the day surgery total joint replacements, uh, which has lots of the, lot more other benefits than just uh, you know, competing with other hospitals like in US. We don't have such competition. Next, please. So how do we achieve that? How do we achieve early recovery, fast recovery, uh, patients to be able to go home without pain the same day? Uh, that is by us as a surgeon at the, this uh, mature age of uh, 56, I, had, I, I still went to learn the new technique of total hip replacement. I, wanted, I was one of the first surgeons in GTA to do a non-invasive muscle sparing hip replacement where we were able to send the patient home the same day. The difference in a traditional way of doing a hip replacement and the new technique is that we don't cut any muscles. We just separate them. We do the hip replacement and we'll put everything back, no suturing, no sewing or anything of the sort, which helps patient recover faster. They can walk right the same day and climb the stairs slowly the same day. So if you look at that yellow line, that's where we go through now instead of from the side. Next, please. So here's the traditional incision on the right-hand side and the newer incision on the left-hand side. And we have improved on that one too. Now we're doing more bikini type incisions rather than long incision, which gives us, gives us better, better access to the hip. So they're even smaller now. Next, please. Sorry about the, uh, some uh, gory details, but I think it's important for you to know. That's how we do the hip replacement. You can see the socket in the bone, which is made of metal. And then you put a plastic liner in there and that completes our hip, uh, hip replacement surgery. Next, please. So we, uh, I had to travel to Belgium to do another fellowship, another training program to learn this. Uh, we took our whole team from Markham Soul Hospital to be able to do this new type of hip replacement. Now we have done over close to 800 or 900 of uh, hip replacements between three of us surgeons uh, since in the last uh, three years or so. Next, please. This is me and my team are traveling uh, uh, to learn these techniques. Next, please. So here's a new way we do the incision now. Instead of being longitudinal, it's more, uh, it's not for cosmetic reasons. It just gets us, gets, gives us better healing and better access. Next, please. We just, people who are technical minded, we have very fine precision tools. And we the, the, the tools we use are out of this world, they are more, they, they, a lot of research and development goes through them. I just want to give you an example because uh, we go to the community to help us fundraise for these type of things too. Um, on the right-hand side is a regular saw blade. On the left-hand side is the one which actually just oscillates, oscillates from the tip. So it doesn't hurt that much soft tissue when we're doing surgery. So these are a few things which have helped us gain the level of um, uh, expertise in doing these um, day surgery, early recovery joints. Next, please. So we did fundraisers. We, our hospital is fortunate enough to um, uh, raise funds for these type of precision tools. Our community has been very supportive and we have a whole orthopedic uh, uh, center, which was donated by the Canadians of Pakistani origin. And uh, they, were, they, uh, they, they donated over $2 million so we are very fortunate here in the Martin Stowell Hospital that our orthopedic program is very well supported by the community. And I think, I think that is the key to the success. Next, please. So next is, I've uh, just, uh, to, just before pandemic started, I started working on robotic project and uh, we had to go to Florida and other uh, places in US to learn how to use robots when doing the knee replacement surgery. Uh, next, please. So if you can play the video, uh, this is not a live patient. This is a, a cadaver. So it just tells you that how we surgeons train uh, when we are training um, and learning the new gadgets and new techniques. We train, we train on the cadavers first, uh, which are not live patients. And you can see how um, now we can look at the screen and robot guide our hand and makes our cuts even more precise so these, the, the thing which is covered in the plastic because it has to be sterile is a robot. It's, it's helping me navigate my tool so I'm even more precise than I was 
before. So it helps uh, recovery even faster, less soft tissue damage, but it is very early with robots yet, but we are working on it. Hopefully uh, in the near future, we'll have uh, one of the top robots. Next, please. Thank you so much, everybody, for listening. I hope I didn't uh, take too much of your time. And uh, I'll welcome any questions if you guys have. Thank you again. So let me ask you the first question. You, the patients you like, you put them to sleep during the surgery, right? Yes, of course. And the awkward patients, they stay awake. No. Yeah. Well, the, the, it, well, the, these are not my decisions. Basically, it's a decision which is made between the anesthesiologist and the patient. Patients have their own liking and dislikings too, but the main factor is the safety. Safety trumps everything. If somebody has a heart problem, lung problem, sleep apnea, stuff like that, anesthesia is not going to put them to sleep sleep because that increases their risk of complications tremendously high. Because general anesthesia is way more riskier than a spinal anesthesia. Spinal anesthesia means your lower half of the body is asleep, but you're awake, but they still give you something to go to sleep and snore away. But sometimes patients do wake up in the, but they have no feeling. They have no, no sensation or anything. And some people actually demand that they want to be staying awake. They want to listen to the music and so on and so forth. So it's all sorts of patients actually, but they're, the, the, the majority of patients are asleep, whether there's a tube down your throat or not, it's a different story. But even with the spinal anesthesia, they will still put them to sleep and they will be, uh, they will not, they have no clue what's going on. Fantastic, great. Okay, uh, let me go to the chat very quickly and see sort of what uh, questions we already have. Uh, starting, uh, Lifestyle changes, you already talked about that. Um, okay, yeah, I think uh, here's a point reinforced by uh, one of our uh, participants. What you have told us is, is really what we needed to hear rather than go with peer pressure to, you know, yeah, go and get the surgery done. But you sort of laid down sort of when to get that surgery done. Wonderful. I think that is what the point was there. Um, what is the next one? Um, yeah, waiting periods. How, how long are the waiting periods? That's a very good question because um, waiting at pandemic has really messed up the system. And uh, before pandemic, I think our waiting periods were really, we were catching up really well. Uh, but for, because the very few surgeons do partial knee replacements, so my, I get patients from all over. Um, so my waiting period for a partial knee was close to a year before pandemic, and the total knee was close to seven to eight months. Um, the problem is that uh, because of the pandemic, the backlog is so, so big that although we are trying, which we almost caught up with the second wave, but with the third wave, we have gone back to square one. So now the waiting period is almost touching um, two years, but we are hoping, and I think government is working towards it, that they will give us extra OR time so that we can catch up and do extra joints. But there's only so many, uh, because you know it's not a one-man team, it's nurses, anesthesiologists, technicians, and nurses have been working throughout the pandemic tirelessly over the last two years. And some of them are tired, some of them are exhausted, um, so we have to be very mindful because you, you don't want to be working with a tired team. Um, so we have to balance so many, juggle so many balls. But a short answer is for total knee and a hip right now, we're looking at close to probably about 11, 12 months. For a partial knee, we're looking at about if, uh, a year and a half or so. But then we also have ability to choose. Um, we were doing more healthier patients, more less risk patients during pandemic. So we were cherry picking. So that has also artificially changed our list because we didn't want to bring in patients with high risk. Just for completeness, how many hospitals in the GTA do these types of surgeries? Well, you know, uh, if, you look, if, you, if you look at uh, Oxford knee, partial knee replacement, 
No hospital in downtown does this surgery. All the university health network, and uh, we have been, uh, you know, baffled and struggled with this uh, for a very long time. And tr actually, the residents come to us to get trained um, for these type of techniques. And even with the uh, minimal invasive hip replacement surgeries, uh, the university hospitals were very late to pick up. Um, maybe it's the, the, the surgeons, maybe it's the system, because bigger ships need a big, big uh, uh, place to turn and they take a long time to turn around. Um, we are more nimble. We are more sensitive to the needs of our community. Uh, to be fair with them, they see all sorts of complications and complicated cases too. Uh, but we are uh, lucky enough to be able to respond to the changes faster. So, uh, so keeping that in mind, I would say if you look at Oxford Me, about, out of, uh, let's say, if we have uh, 100 hospitals in, in Ontario, um, I think probably seven or eight would be doing uh, the partial knee. But I must say that uh, between us and Scarborough, uh, we are the number one in whole Canada in terms of number of uh, um, partial knees we do. Um, um, in Scarborough, there was once a surgeon who just retired. Uh, I think he did, he was an elderly person. He did quite a, quite a bit of them. I was next and hopefully I have a few more years to go. Um, so they are, uh, 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 one odd surgeon here, there, Ottawa is next where they do partial knees and then Vancouver and so on. So yeah, so there are few few hospitals for sure, uh, but not not many. I get a lot of patients up from, for example, Brampton, Mississauga and those areas as well because no one does that there. At hip replacement. So, so every surgery has different hospitals do different things. Sure, wonderful, thank you. Uh, this is a common question. Um, when you bend your knees, for example, and you hear a click, uh, I don't know what the term is. Is that a mm. sign of uh, arthritic uh, start, arthritis it, it, starting? It is, uh, but depends what kind of click. So if you're going down the stairs and if you hear grinding, your knee making noises, which has been going on for years, that is arthritis. If you hear, if you didn't have a click and suddenly you develop the click, that may be a meniscal tear, uh, which is a cushion inside your knee, which acts like a shock absorber, which I showed you the image of very first that finger type thing sticking in the middle of the joint, that is a meniscus. So it could be a tear, but in younger people that tears because of sports like soccer, baseball, and injury. In, in, in older group, uh, above 45 and so, it can break by just coming out of the car. And that's why I showed you the picture of those uh, people who are in their 45s and 50s and so on. And they're coming, getting up from a low, low height. They hear a click and then the knee swells up, it's painful, and then they keep hearing that click. So that click signifies a meniscal tear. The grinding signifies arthritis. So during prayers, when you bend down, for example, mm -hmm. or you go down to kneel, um, is that when you hear a click during that motion? It's a very good question because uh, over the years, I have had this question a lot of times because I've got a big population of people who pray, go on the floor. And it's not just Muslim population. We have people from uh, Brampton, Missaga who go to their gurdwaras and they go and kneel on the floors. And this is a very common problem. And... Um, to me, kneeling down for praying and getting up is good for the knees. My research, my reading over the years have told me that range of motion and stretching is absolute key to the joint health. Hence yoga, hence stretching. Hence, so if you're not a person who is disciplined and who does yoga and these type of exercises, and if you pray, and if that's the only time you're going to stretch, we might as well do it. It's going to hurt a little bit, but it will preserve your joints mobility for a very long time. So absolutely no harm. Actually, they did a research in Middle East and they said, oh, the people who pray, they get more arthritis because they sit on the floor. And that was half truth because they didn't, what they didn't tell the public is that Middle East is one of the most obese um, uh, region 
in the world. If you look at the obesity scale and Google it tonight, I'll challenge you. You'll see some of the Middle Eastern countries at one of the top five of people who are obese. So if you, if you do not tell people that, oh, those people were also over BMI 45 and you blame sitting on the floor uh, for your arthritis, that's not the real science. That's not the real truth. So if you do not change your lifestyle and you're obese and you're not doing stretching and your diet is unhealthy, we cannot blame sitting on the floor for this arthritis like I alluded to you earlier. That weight causes problems like that tire and the hormones created from the fat, liposome, can cause destruction of the cartilage. So to me, kneeling is beneficial. If you can kneel for as long as you can kneel, you should. Excellent, thank you. Um, just going down the questions here. Um, do a kind of bacteria also consume cartilage leaving behind bare bone? Uh, Absolutely. Okay. One of I, the one of the big one of the emergency one of the you know in my specialty, there are few emergencies where you have to get up in the middle of the night and go and treat the patient. One of them is an open fracture if the bone is sticking out from the skin. And the other one, one of the other ones is septic joint, infected joint. It's not one bacteria, any bacteria which gets into the knee joint has potential of destroying the cartilage within a few hours. And cartilage is almost impossible to grow back if that happens. So if you are a 26 year old or 32 year old guy and you get infection in the knee joint, which can happen, which, which is usually the source is somewhere else, either um, uh, your urine infection, other the, uh, any infection in your blood would go and seed in the joint. So in that case, uh, that joint needs to be washed out at ASAP, get rid of all the pus and bacteria, otherwise this cartilage will get destroyed. So yes, it, absolutely, infection in the joint is a disaster. Okay, thank you. Uh, the question is, can you please discuss the entity of joggers arthritis and its potential prevention? Well, but, there but... is no such thing as joggers arthritis. Our, our uh, science and research over the years have bared this out that jogging does not cause arthritis um, in any shape and form. It's the design of your leg which does. So people, even some physicians don't pay attention to this, and I have to go over and over this again, that you are born with a certain type of legs. Either you have your mother's legs or your father's legs, or your grandfather's legs, or your grandmother's legs. The shape of that leg dictates what's going to happen to you in combination of the type of activities you do. For example, if a person who is knocked knee, means the knees are... Um, not bow-legged, but the opposite, that when he touches his legs together, his feet do not touch, the knees touch first. So that's called the knocked knee or valgus knee. If this person takes up any activity which involves lots of lunging, squatting, cycling, he's gonna destroy his kneecap. So you have to be very specific. Jogging, the style of jogging with the shape of the leg and the type of surface you jog on and the type of shoes you wear has absolute um, uh, effect on whether you're, you're gonna destroy your knee or build your knee. The same exercise can either build your knee or destroy your knee. Same thing with cycling. People ask me this question all the time. Can I bike? Will biking help? Absolutely. But if your bike is from Costco and not well-fitted and you, smaller than your size, and nothing against Costco, but I'm saying is that you need to have bike which is well fitted to you. If your seat is too low, you will destroy your knee. If your seat is appropriately adjusted, you will not only save your back, but will also save you. Fantastic, good information. Is there a diet that can help? Uh, it says osteoporosis arthritis. I don't know if there's such a thing. How much, okay, yeah, that's the question. So that's why I wanted to clarify this very early that it is often confused. Osteoarthritis and osteoporosis are completely two different diseases. 
They occur in the very similar area. Osteoporosis is a disease of bone. Osteoarthritis is not a disease of bone. It's a disease of the cover of the bone, which is called the cartilage. So we have to differentiate that. So yes, osteoporosis diet is important. So if your calcium, vitamin D levels, if it's not enough in your diet, then it makes a difference. On the other hand, osteoarthritis, we have done, we have read, done, and uh, uh, lots of research has been published on this, that really there is no diet. I don't think it has anything to do with diet. People will swear by it. And you know, when we were growing up, our elderly used to tell us about the, the turmeric. Now it's the rage all over the place. Um, really, there is no clear cut scientific evidence. And when we talk about scientific evidence, that means the proof. Absence of proof does not mean that this is the, the, this is the whole truth. Um, but right now, if you keep your weight under control, but the other thing is that if your body fat content is higher and muscle content is low, you're gonna have higher level of hormone which destroys the cartilage. So I really think that people pay too much attention to the diet. It's not the diet. It's the genes, it's the weight, and it's the injuries which can affect all this. Thank you. Um, this is probably related to what you just talked about, uh, glucosamine, chondroitin, sulfate. sulfate. Yeah. <laughs> right, sorry <laughs> about that. So, is there any you know, role? If, I, if I, you know, in my practice, I see patients who got the uh, bracelets made of copper and they swear by it. Um, and I don't discourage them. I tell them, you know, whatever rocks your boat, whatever makes you feel good, as long as you're active, the goal is to stay active. And people have this misconception that if we are more active, we're going to wear our joints out more. That is completely the opposite. It's not like that truck I showed you, not like that car I showed you. Human body likes movement. Movement is life. And the key is to absolutely keep moving. Chondritin sulfate, um, we, we humans relate everything to eating because it's the very satisfying and easy way to solve the problems. Uh, glucosamine and chondritin sulfate is one of the components of the cartilage matrix. Right? Your cartilage does not break down because you have lack of these two components. Your cartilage breakdowns, our cartilage break down because of dehydration. That this, because cartilage, if you look under the microscope, has a jelly in it, which has a high water content. And over the years, which scientists still don't know the reason, that it stops retaining the water as much as it does. Maybe it's like a tire of a car or a tube of a bike's bicycle, it starts becoming leaky and then it starts collapsing. When it starts collapsing, then it shreds like a tire, which is, which is, which is punctured. So eating glucosamine with chondroitin sulfate is not going to solve the problem because you, your issue is not that there's a lack of this. In, in your regular healthy diet, there's enough of it. But if it makes you feel better, um, and if there are no side effects, I have no problem. You can go big bottle of jointies and take two tablets a day. There's one study which was carried out in Europe, which showed a minimal improvement in the quality of patients, life. minimal improvement, which was not even significant, statistically significant difference. Because very hard to measure the effect because uh, the changes are so small on MRIs and X's. They didn't even do the MRI scans. Anyway, so that's a... Uh, Long answer to a short question. Oh, that's fine, thank you. No, it's just <laughs> after three. Are you okay to stay on for another 10 minutes or so? Well, if people are okay, I've got another five, uh, another 10 minutes are fine. Okay, wonderful, thank you. Uh, a friend has a, had a full knee replacement surgery and uh, she's asking about the sciatic condition. Uh, any connection or uh, would it affect the knee? Well, the answer surgery. is yes and no. 
there's no direct connection. But the problem is people who have arthritis in one joint, they generally have arthritis in other parts of the body because cartilage genetics is the same. And there can be a design problem. They can be obese. So the problem occurs that these things can happen side by side. But if you're limping because you have a knee problem and you're limping and you have a bad back, your, bad, your back is going to get affected. And vice versa. If you have a sciatic problem, the sciatic nerve controls the muscle of your thigh and the leg. And if, if it's a bad problem, which I don't know whether it is or not, but if it's affecting the muscles in your leg, then your knee replacement will not function properly. So it can be a symbiotic relationship between the two. But I see this very, very often that, people, that arthritis is not exclusive to one joint. If they have arthritis in one joint, very likely they will have arthritis in the back, another knee, and so on and so forth. I think you already covered this next question in your presentation, but maybe worth repeating. If the knee is bone to bone, would you recommend cortisone or jelly? I think. Uh... Sure. I, I always encourage my patients not to rush into the last solution first. So I definitely would try and I do not rush. I do not do surgery as a first option. I always encourage my patients to change lifestyle, go to physio, try one or two anti-inflammatory once or twice a week and low doses. <clears throat> but if that's not cutting it, the next thing is injection. But you have to be very careful with these injections. Number one, some of them have side effects, especially cortisol. So for example, if you're diabetic, if you have uh, osteoporosis, if you have any risk of infection in the knee joint, you, you got, if you're immunocompromised, you got to be careful because cortisone or prednisone is an immuno immunosuppressant. It suppresses your immunity, your body's ability to fight infection. It also can increase your blood sugar significantly. So you have to be careful when you go for these injections. They are great. They work really well. So if you're desperate, if you're going on a wedding, on a holiday or on a cruise or something, and your knee is bothering you. And I get this lineup of the snowbirds um, uh, in October and November before they go to Florida. And they want to have a shot before they go because they want to have a, a decent time over there. Uh, it works for the short term, which is can be weeks or months. But you cannot have too many of these injections. Number one, they start losing their efficacy. I'm talking about cortisone. And number two, they have side effects. So the next level up was this gel. The biggest roadblock to the gel is the cost, which is close to 600 or something. But the second thing is it doesn't work for everybody. It works for about, let's say, 55% of the patients. That if it works, then we don't know whether it works for six months or works for a year. Like I said, ge genetics play that part. So if you're bone on bone, you can try once or twice this stuff. And I have, I have a bunch of patients who come one, for one injection every year and they are, they are living a decent quality of life. So the bottom line is pain. The bottom line is your quality of life. I would start simple. I will start with weight loss, physio, pills. Doesn't work, you go next step up, try cortisone. That doesn't work, try gel. And if that doesn't work, go for surgery. Don't waste your time on the orthobiologics because they are expensive. You are bone on bone. It's not gonna grow cartilage. If you're early arthritis, absolutely, you should do it. But if you're bone on bone and if nothing else has cut it, you're wasting your time. Okay, related to that is the Humira injection for rheumatoid arthritis. Would you recommend that? Well, rheumatoid arthritis is a totally different ballgame, right? Because th that's an autoimmune disease. That's a disease which not only just affects the cartilage, it affects almost every soft tissue in your body, which is the ligaments, which is the immune system, which is the, the cartilage, the bone, and so on and so forth. So that's a whole different discussion based on your blood work, based on what rheumatology plans for you, what you have tried and failed, it's a great drug in a right person, but it's a bad drug in a wrong person. Right, right. Um, so what is the process? Someone has a pain 
go to the family physician, GP, uh, we would then at some stage refer you, refer the patient to the hospital. They won't come straight to you or your team, right? How does it work? No, so that's true. So most of the hospitals are now working towards an, um, uh, an early rapid access for these type of patients. It's still a years away from being implemented appropriately. But I think to me, absolute key is these type of sessions where patients get the knowledge. Because if patients, I see a big difference in patient who is knowledgeable and patient who is not. And patients who are knowledgeable and take a keen interest in their health and what's happening to their health, they fare far better than patients who don't. And the absolute key is to understand what their problem is. Knowledge is everywhere nowadays. There's no excuse. So, and when they go to the GP, you have absolute right to demand that I want this. I've read this and they should answer the question. The problem I face is that even the GPs are not, some good GPs, they're very aware of it. But uh, 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 some GPs, they will see a knee pain, they'll write me one line, knee pain, no x-ray, no, uh, uh, no standing x-ray, just send an ultrasound to me, which has zero value whatsoever. And or they, if they are very, uh, if they think that they are doing a, lot, a big favor to the patient, they'll send an MRI scan. Um, but MRI scan shows too many things which you don't want to know. And it sets you at a very wrong path because MRI scan will show meniscal tear, this tear, that tear, and the panic sets in and patients in panic and GPs in panic. And they are referring patients to the surgeon. We're getting calls, oh, he's a meniscal tear, he's not been seen for two months. That sets a completely wrong signal to the patient, to the physician. So the reason I discussed this today you do not need anything fancy. What our patients should demand from the family doctor for a standing x-ray. That to me, if you, if you do not take anything from today's talk, take one thing, x-ray of the knee. I'm talking about knee, hip really doesn't matter as much, but absolute important is that they should demand that I get a standing x-ray. So I think it's important. So the short answer is, yes, unfortunately, the procedure is still the same. You have to go to your GP. You have to ask them for a referral. And GP, if they are aware, they'll send this to a, a fast track systems once they are implemented. Otherwise, they'll send you to the family physician, to the, to the specialist, depending on who they are dealt with in the past. But the, what I see is that 70% of knee replacements does not have to be a full knee replacement. And a lot of people are getting their normal cartilage, healthy cartilage and bone destroyed and the ligaments destroyed just because surgeons cannot do certain type of procedure. So I think knowledge to the patient is power to the patient. When patients know their choices, they can make the right decisions themselves. Hmm. Okay, I have a few technical questions, which I, because of time pressures, uh, I won't cover those. There are a lot of questions on uh, arthritis in general. Arthritis of the of the joints, uh, shoulder or or uh, hands. Can you comment on that? I know you're a uh, orthopedic surgeon. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, to me, family history is the number one reason. Number two is wear and tear and injuries. If you have overused, for example, people who work with their hands all their life, you can see their hands when they're older that they become nod, nod, uh, nobly, they can nod you. So that is part of the, so not everybody who works hard gets that. So why not? Because genetics has a big role to play. And so I think we can reverse some of these changes. We can prevent some of these problems. Arthritis, reason we talked about just osteoarthritis today, there are multiple forms of arthritis. Majority of other ones are inflammatory which are not related to age and wear and tear, but they are rare, they're not common. So we talked about today about osteoarthritis because it is the commonest form of arthritis and disability. So arthritis in general means loss of cartilage. So wherever in your body there is cartilage, you're gonna have arthritis. Based on your genetics, based on your work, 
based on the use and injuries, the one particular joint will be affected more than the others. For example, we see the shoulder arthritis very rarely. It's not common. It is not as common as the knee because knee gets injured more. You get a lot of twisting on the knee, gets used every day. You're standing on it all the time. Its anatomy is such that it allows you a lot of flexibility, but on the other hand, it's sensitive to injury. So joints which are not as weight-bearing and as mobile will get more arthritis versus the joints which are not. Hands, like, you know, as humans, we use hands all the time. They'll wear out faster. So it's a common sense thing. So arthritis, you cannot change your genetics, but like I said earlier, you can change two things for sure. One is your weight. Second is your lifestyle. Was the second one? Lifestyle. Thank you. So that was my final question. Your closing remarks, including how important exercise, which is walking and biking and you know, whatever else, how important that is. So with your final comments, right. please, Dr. Haider. So I will join the final comments and the answer to this question together, just in the interest of time. And thank you everybody for listening patiently. And sorry if I couldn't get to all your questions. Um, and uh, it's been great meeting all of you, although it wasn't in person, but uh, hopefully in the future we will. Um, and thank you, um, uh, Nazmul Damjibai, to uh, uh, introduce me and to introduce me to lovely people all across the world. Um, and I will uh, definitely uh, try to uh, make myself available if anybody has a question down the road. Um, but I would like you to take two messages home today from this talk. And if you just remember these two, uh, I think we have achieved something today. Number one, your health is in your own control. Physicians are your partners. S surgeon like myself I, is your partner, but it has to be a team effort. I, my knife cannot solve your problems if you cannot solve your own problems. So if you come to a surgeon and ask that your knee should be fixed, he, a good surgeon would expect you to do your part. And your part starts with gaining knowledge, which I'm glad that you took the first step to some extent today. But do not stop seeking knowledge. Knowledge will save you from lots of hassles. Do not go to the doctors blindfolded. Do not go to a professional because it is their, it's, it's their respect is that you acquire some sort of knowledge before you go and talk to them. And nowadays there's no excuse. Everything uh, is available. So please keep learning. And when you go to your GP, ask for a standing X-ray, like I said. It'll save, do not worry about MRI scan. Do not worry about ultrasound. A good physician with a simple x-ray and a hand examination with hands-on examination will figure out what's wrong with you. So that's number one. Number two, stay as active as possible. All these concepts of if I do this that much, it's gonna bother my knee, it's gonna arthritis is gonna get worse. That is a myth. We have to make sure that our weight is under control because if a heavy person starts running, it's gonna be a problem. So use common sense. Do not rush into one, because one day you wake up and say, hey, I'm gonna lose weight in two days. Uh, and in the process, I see so many injuries just trying to do that. So don't do that. If you are overweight, try to lose weight. Exercise in losing weight has a very little role, to be honest is the eating part, which is the hardest part. 70% of weight loss will come from your eating habits and 30% will come from your exercise because it will just keep you motivated. So just remember that. But stay active. If, you, if, if we are overweight, we don't have to run. Walking, slow walking has zero value. Fast walking for even short period of time has lot more value than walking slow. So a lot of people go and they stroll around and come back after an hour and they think they've done exercise. Any exercise which does not make you breathless 
within five minutes of starting that exercise has lot less value than the exercise which makes you breathless in five minutes. Because your oxygen level goes up in the blood, everything in human body is dependent on oxygen. Your cartilage, your healing capacity, your blood which takes the flow to that cartilage. So breathless, get breathless, do exercise. Thank you so much. I think this is uh, more than enough for today. If you can take these two messages home, I think we have achieved something today. Dr. Heider, I mean, this is amazing. You've given us so much information. You're just more than a surgeon, eh? <laughs> You've given us an all round information. Uh, so really, really appreciate it. I'll send you the chat and you'll see, you know, all the comments we've received. Uh, everyone certainly enjoyed it. And uh, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge with us. Much, much appreciated. Right. Yes, and thank you so much.